Thank you. Thank you. I guess we can and get started. Thank you, everybody, joining us. You know, after after lunch. You know, uh, always. You know, a little bit like full after lunch. <laughs> And you know, um, this session this afternoon, I'm your moderator. My name is Chi. I work for GHD, and we are a environmental um, consulting firm. And I do, you know, air dispersion modeling, you know, air quality permitting. And uh, I am going to be your first presenter as well. Um, my my topic, to, the the first topic, my first topic is about. Um, Dispersion modeling, it, uh, it's kind of like assuming, you know, we have been doing some air mod already. So any of you guys had done modeling? Great, great, great. So we talk about some interesting little tool that, you know, people can create that, you know, outside, you know, the third party, you know, software is like, you know, like software, you know, like a graphical user interface, you know, and you know kind of like do something outside of it you know create some little interesting tools that you know automate you know streamline your model creation your eva you know results evaluation so for you know like in case some there are some complicated you know scenarios and at the end we want to you know we want to explore you know if there is any chance of you know artificial intelligence or machine learning can you know, involve in the future of modeling that I don't have to set up my model and just go ahead and, you know, have the computer do it for me. So, so the key takeaways uh, for, for this presentation is, you know, like, so first we're going to talk about where's the change? What, what, you know, our, you know, like little tools comes in for what, for what reason? And why do we need to automate? And you know, discuss about what kind of tools we have, and some case talk about some case studies. I'm gonna share some of the little interesting, funny, fun tools that you know uh, that I created. In fact, I got some you know a new case study that I have not get a chance to put into the presentations yet, but I'll talk about it. But you know, sorry about that. You know, I was so busy. You know during the last couple of weeks doing reporting season. <laughs> so I uh, didn't get a chance to do everything on this presentation. And then what's next? What's next? Like AI or machine learning? What are we looking at? So where's the change? You know, if you have been doing dispersion model, I'm sure that you know, you know how the air mod system is designed. So we got met data feed into air met. It creates some surface profile, uh, you know, metadata that can be used for, you know, air mod ready. And then you process air map, you process BPIP. So, and all these, you know, information you pre process and feed to air mod, and air mod runs and then, you know, generates the output file, you know, the concentrations, the uh, high first high, high second high, you know, 99, 98 percentile results. And it creates a plot, plot file, the contour that you can visualize using graphical user interface, or you can put it into Surfer or whatever other like GIS to view the contour pretty nice isoplex. And you can create, you know, maxi file like exceedance file. In, T in Texas, we all know TCEQ request for, you know, what's the frequency of exceedance for, you know, non criteria pollutants for their ESL program. And all, of course, you can create uh, all types of other output files. So what we we come into here to play? So what what about like you know you don't have your defined source location? What about you wanna looking at flexible you know stack design, stack heights, you know varying, and you know and you have very complicated source operation you know combinations and the scenarios. So lots of different, you know, scenario into play. It's not never that easy that, you know, the ideal project I want to do is the client has already done their permit application. They know where their stack is and they hand me their, you know, source input data, you know, where this stack locates, you know, the stack height is how much, you know, and emission rates, you know, um, velocity, temperature, all the different things. 
but we you know sometimes run into difficult projects that we don't have this kind of luxury you kind of like in a design attitude like to help them to determine hey where should you put your stack you know i have another topic talking about whether now modeler, modelers to dictate you know design or not like when i first started doing modeling my 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 mentor was telling me hey you know hey chi you know we are modelers we never dictate where they put the you know stack location we never dictate you know we never tell them what stack height they should they need to go they will tell you that if they don't tell you that you know you cannot run the model and you know you, you don't want that liability or so things like that but with the time change changes like over the last 10 years lots of more construction projects coming in you know with very fast paces demand they don't even have a design but they want to get, get their permit issued you know and you know they always come with very you know ambitious time frame in their mind like I want to build this. I want to build it in within the three three months, and you're gonna do the modeling for me. Submit to TCEQ, get get them to uh, you know approve for me. So this create a challenge. We we'll talk about that later. Like what what do we do? So why do we automate? You know, so we can create like we said, we can create lots of different var. There are lots of moving parts, variables. You know where you put your stack. You can put it here and there. Maybe five different locations. Uh, your stack height can have uh, six, you know, or seven, you know, different combinations. And the combination that that alone, five locations, seven stack heights, gives you 35 scenarios. Uh, it quickly multiplies each other. So we can automatically, you know, using some, you know, customized uh, little gadgets, tools, we can create those, you know, model input files or so model create those source groups for different scenarios easily. You don't have to hand enter the source groups like you know group one group two or you don't have to go into your graphical user interface to pick one two three and put into one group and the other four into the other group that kind of like makes things like a very a lot of a lot of like a, you know labor hours put into that so and that you know also creates some you know challenges of human mistakes uh i have experience i had to put together like a 40 different groups and uh, that by that time i don't know any programming i have to manually write write it and uh, of course i made a lot of mistakes and you know uh you know have to kind of come back and qa qc and correct it later on so by automating you're already telling computer write a program telling computer to do all those different combinations no human mistakes you just need to check your code you don't have to check your groups as long as your code, the logic is right. You know, uh, your groups, your input will be right. Um, and again, you know, like if you have some cool tools, you know, set up and in the next time you want to do the same thing, you know, used to be a long human, you know, human efforts can be now just computer task. So what kind of tools that we have, you know, like, you know, I, I personally use a Python, you know, lang language, but you know, you can use any of the programming language that you like to to write a script, uh, put in the loop to create a lots of, you know, um, you know, like repetitive tasks that you use to face. Um, and this presentation, I'll share some, you know, like ideas of coding. I'm not gonna do talk about all the line by line codes. Uh, that's not going to, you know, we ha don't have enough time to do that here. But you know, I'm gonna share some ideas. You know, what is you know what can you think about? You know, what can you do with with that? So I'm gonna share three uh, case studies actually here. Uh, the case study one is um, scenario analysis for inputs creation, and uh, the case study two that here post processing. You know, we we kind of pull out the outputs. And we want to post processing the frequency of exceedances. Uh, that's my case study too. The third one is I just worked on that uh, last week was a, like a emissions event modeling that we have a flare. And it's, you know, like we are modeling our emissions, but, you know, uh, AirMod can do varying, you know, emission rates, temperature, or velocity, but it cannot vary the diameter. How do we do that? Um, 
So the first case study. Um, so what happened is this this site, you know, this, this is a, like a very simplified version of it. In fact, we have uh, tons more than that, you know, sources. They want to put in two RTOs, but they have four different possible locations. They are not decided yet. You know, in reality, they have 16 different locations. You know how I imagine, you know, how kind of challenge it is. And they, they, they've, they've got the, some furnace, you know, on, you know, furnace on the side. They have about like, they, could, they have two scenarios. It could either be that, you know, they separate into 10 different stacks. Each furnace has its own stack, or they can put it into two combined stack. And they, they've got some, you know, emergency engines can be in either of the four, you know, rectangular black shape place. So, so what, what do we do, you know? Um, it's all open ended design. The client come back and say, hey, I want to have these kind of source, but I don't know where to put it yet. And my design team has not finalized it yet, but it, it's give us this kind of like framework. You know, you play with that. Um, so what they said, they want all the options evaluated and not only this, but also, you know, stack heights, different, you know, different stack heights. Of course, they want to lower the possible. Um, but you know, it all you know, kind of like a dispersion modeling results needs to dictate that. So the traditional approach before that, you know, I start to play with programming language. I will consult with uh, you know the client. I'll consult with TCEQ and give this plot plan to them. Say, hey, you know, TCEQ. So it's all you know uncertain. What do you recommend? They will say, hey, you know, we're not sure. We wanna we wanna we want to look at all the possibility we want to look at the worst case basically but where is the worst case we don't know uh so for some you know very intuitive uh worst case you would think okay um because this two black dots of rto is closest to the boundary okay i'll put it there and uh you know if i separate the furnaces they'll have less flow rate i'll use the separate as my worst case and the look at that you know position to play place your emergency generators okay these combinations is my worst case but questions that i may want to ask and also tcq may come back and ask what if the main direction you win the direction from the south so maybe your upper two locations of rto could be Worst case, you know, when wind blows from south, you know, majority, you know, and has a may maybe like very bad day of weather. So, um, and well, the worst case setup for uh, short term evaluations be having the it is truly the worst case for long term. No, we don't know. And uh, you know, another question like the emergency generator sets that we they. They, they generally, you know, like if you are doing intermittent source, you know, kind of like a process for NOx or SO2, they may not be really the most contributing source. So does it, what, what is worth to put it in here? Or maybe, you know, would it really worth to evaluate it? And uh, some additional challenge questions from TCQ, they, 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 they may not really give you enough like suggestions, you know, they, they may in the first model will tell you uh, maybe this will be our, you know, worst case scenario. But when they get to the team leader for review, another person may have another opinion. So the best thing to do is to evaluate them all. So what we did. So for the RTOs, you got to have two two RTOs in four different locations. So all the possibilities, six possibilities. Engines, four different possibilities, furnace setup, you know, all, you know, like two, two options. So why, why not create all the 48 different scenarios? I know this sounds like a little kind of crazy, it started getting a little crazy, 48, but in real life, the number can go even higher. Is that kind of like a scare people away? Am I going to be going crazy to run 3,000 runs just for this? The answer is yes. You know, we, we have the computational power now. Like, you know, nowadays you are thinking about a computer which can, you know, mine Bitcoin 
and you know it's more than enough power for it to run air mod it runs 3000 air mod you just divide it into different processors and you know maybe you have a computer for like uh, eight eight processors 24 processors or 64 processors all those computers available you know um putting them putting some you know parallel processing it you know 3000 the 4000 runs can probably be run within like overnight time, you know, shouldn't be too terrible. So, and we don't have to worry about where the worst case is. So that's kind of like uh, uh, some coding tips, you know, create some different loops, you know, like, and putting loop in the loop. A three, in, in this case, you got like a three different levels of like, uh, it's kind of like just basically pick the first one from the first group, like the RTOs, it can have the, uh, you know, like a group one, and then pick, you know, one engine, and then pick a furnace scenario, and it creates that all 48. With that loop, you create 48 different scenarios, but you know, it, you don't have to write it. You just need to provide the computer with correct logic. It'll create no matter 48, 480, 3000, it can do all of them for you. Um, so that's the case study number one. Um, now I would like to talk about the, the, this is like, a, you know, on the front end, like you create some model input, you know, like, you know, kind of like a creating the model input for the model to run. That's the front end. And later we'll talk about the rear end. You know, when you get the results, how do you, you know, like uh, manipulate data in an efficient way. But before that, you know, I may want to share um, the Flare uh, project. I was working on it like last week. So uh, I don't know if you guys uh, heard this kind of emissions event modeling that TCQ sometimes ask. It's not for permitting, but if you had some, you know, like uh, emissions event, like excessive emissions, and you report it, TCQ will look at your emissions and tell you, hey, you know, I want you to do dispersion modeling to tell me how significant your impact is. This model does not, you know, aim to compare, like to demonstrate any compliance. Uh, you can, you know, you, you can have an SO2 pretty high and you don't have to be obligated to say, I, I need to be below the NAX for not SO2 or NOx. Or uh, for speciated VOCs, they are looking at some air monitoring comparison value called AMCV, not ESL. If you don't have an AMCV, you look at the ESL, but you know, that's another story. So, so um, the client had an, an event of like about 500 hours, like about 20 days. They, you know, they got very sour gas. That it's like oil and gas, you know, like uh, in oil and gas, you know, field. Uh, they are suddenly there, you know, gas become very sour and, you know, you know, they cannot sell them, put in the sales, sales line. So they have to flare it. And quickly, it's reaching their permit limit. So you cannot, you know, like they put together a excessive, you know, emission event report and give it to the state. State ask for modeling. And the client did a really good job in capturing all the, every hours of, you know, flow rate, so that they can calculate hourly emissions. That actually automatically, you know, is a one step up from just modeling an average or worst case, um, you know, emissions hourly worst case emissions with your worst case, you know, stack parameter. Um, with everything worst case, you apparently will come up with a very high uh, significant impact, which TCEQ will review, you review a number and based on that, determining what the enforcement action they, they're going to impose on you. You know, if you are like a 10 times higher than X, okay, so that's going to be a higher fine. If it's just a two times X, maybe a smaller fine or just a warning, if you are just below the NAX, okay, so they, they probably just say something, be, be careful or something like that, and no significant fine or like enforcement results. So um, with the hourly emissions, we were able, you know, we create an hourly emission file that we, you know, using Excel or whatever, you can write a code, but it's not worth it. Um, you know, you can use a Excel file to create like 500 lines of hourly file for that one, uh, one flare. But, there is a problem with Flare. In TCEQ, um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar, in TCEQ's guidance, 
the flare is modeled as a pseudo point. You use the flare tip as the height, and they prescribe 1,000 degrees C as the temperature and the 20 meters per second of uh, you know velocity. But you know the the diameter is calculated from a net heat release. You know, like uh, how much you know uh, heat you're releasing from that time. And you know it's calculated based on you know your MMBTU per hour of that hour and your you know molecular weight of that stream, and it you know kind of creates a equivalent, uh, so-called equivalent diameter. So an air mod, interestingly, it allows you to vary by hour of every single source of emission rate, and temperature, and velocity. Temperature velocity, you know. It can vary every hour, but nobody thinks of, you know, a varying, you know, diameters, you know, stack, stack diameter. It's not varying. So AirMod does not allow that. So I made a call to TCK. So what, what do we do with that? Can I use a, should I use the worst case? Like I found all the, you know, equivalent diameter using the worst case, the smallest one that gives you the lowest momentum. Or can I use an average? They say, I'm sure you can use worst case. OK, I run the model with worst case. Results are pretty worse. <laughs> and it's like about two times, you know, SO2 max. And we don't want to submit that. You know, we're going to receive some fine. <laughs> so so he, he tells me, hey, you can probably do some scenario like you using each hour as your scenario. Each hour. You have a different diameter. You can create different stacks and tell the model. Okay, so this hour, the first hour, your your first stack is emitting. Second hour, your second stack is emitting. But you know, but I tell TCK, hey, it's 500 hours. Say, oh, okay, so. <laughs> um, but this is the, their suggestion. So, but you know, thinking about programming it. Okay, so I don't have to write. 500 times 500 out, you know, lines because you, you're going to have 500 hours. Each hour you have 500 a source. It's 500 times 500. How much is that? 250,000. OK, my gosh, you know, I, I cannot, you know, do it in Excel. So write a program like two level of, you know, two level of loop, uh, you know, kind of like uh, and make it like if uh, if the the hour matches. OK, so then that source is emitting, and if not, then emission is zero. But you know, I can then varying you know the diameters, and I was able to get the final results of SO2, like one third of an X. That kind of helps the client, you know, really kind of like get out of that trouble of being being get a, like a fine or like big fine or something like that. So that's kind of like a, those little, very little gadgets, a little programs you you never thought about before you know, think about it that's going to bring a lot some more fun to your dispersion modeling works now you know let, let me get back to the case the second case study that you know i prepared last year so it's now uh, a rear end so now you have run the model so i have a, a facility that uh, you know like a surface coding facility they emit like they, they use like about 40 different you know, paints or, you know, like a thinners. Apparently each paint you have a list of, you know, different, you know, pollutants that, you know, like uh, you, need, you have to evaluate ESL for. And, you know, uh, so we end up with about 250, you know, speciated chemicals. Um, the state, you know, requires that, you know, for, e to do the ESL modeling. Okay, so um, for short term, you know, it's, you know, it's not that simple as you, you run the model, tell the states, okay, it's pass or not. It's really, you know, there is a step behind in you know, after your initial run to determine the frequency of exceedance that they can do some, you know, allow some exceedance. Like for example, over land uh, industrial area, you are allowed to exceed 24 hours of you know, time, you know, like uh, that you are greater than two times ESO, but 10 hours when greater than four times ESO. If you are less than that, you know, it's automatically good. But 
If you are more than that, it's not end of the world. They would just want to see your exceedance. Let's say if you have some 36 hours, sometimes they will just say, okay, 72 is fine. But when this number go, grows up like to 200, 500 hours of exceedance, okay, so then you want to look at, you want to look at your, you know, like uh, refinement of your emissions. So I'm sure, you know, you all know that, you know, um, you know, like initial approach, like traditional approach, we'll just set up the model, but, you know, we don't tell the model what pollutant it is. We'll just say one pound per hour emissions. And then, you know, it's called like a unit impact multiplier for each different source and do that calculation. The overall screening impact will be this, you know, the sum of all the UIM times their emission rates for different stacks. That, 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 that approach can probably screen out a lot of, you know, pollutants, like 250 usually, like we can get about like 30, you know, remaining that they are exceeding the ESL. And then, okay, so we want to set up the refined model with AirMod. I mean, uh, this can be done with in a lot of, you know, third party, you know, AirMod GUIs. And I know there was one software that can actually run after you know you create you create the maxi file like you tell them the model okay so i am looking at the you know results that's over a certain threshold which is a one times esl okay and then you know the maxi file will grab all those you know hours that exceeding it and you can do something with it like traditionally i use just use open up that creates an excel and kind of like a count like by, you know, like if it's like greater than one times ESL or two times ESL, things like that. Or there is a software that you can run one pollutant at a time. It'll tell you how many hours it exceeded one times, two times, four and 10 times. Um, but you can also write a program. And I wrote a program that can, you know, automatically go through all the 30, all the 40 different maxi files at one time. And you know, um, to create something, a table like that, um, you don't have to run one pollutant at a time with that, you know, like a third party GUI that, you know, like very famous. And, you know, and it can also, you know, because if you create your own program, you can, you can do 20 times ESL, 25 times ESL that's sometimes needed for uh, over water evaluation. So, um so make something you know for yourself and uh some ideas of doing that is you know like kind of like a it's important thing is you you know you use you use a module you know like a, like kind of can run through all the files in that one directory you don't have to um you don't have to kind of like uh, go through one by one and uh, the performance of you know your own tool can can be like, I was able to evaluate 40 different pollutants, uh, 40 different exceedance file within like about 10 seconds. While, you know, using Excel, apparently it's gonna be probably a whole morning of time <laughs> or a whole day of time. Or if you use, uh, you know, like the third party, I know that, you know, kind of like a run it by one by one, you can probably do it within one or two hours, but you know, you kind of like get pretty tired after that. But, you know, so write some program and, uh, you know, that can do the work for you. So um, what's next? Next, I want to talk about, you know, whether we can introduce some AI or machine learning into, into dispersion modeling. I mean, the, the automation I just talked about, the case study one, two, three, is not quite AI machine learning yet. Uh, they, they, you know, in those programming, we just, tell the computer what to do and does it. So uh, AI and machine learning, like they, uh, that kind of like uh, stuff, it kind of creates, you know, a, a learning a learning scheme that, you know, you kind of tell the computer what's the input, you know, what look like that and what's the output. Like it's lots of, uh, you know, supervised kind of like mapping. Like, okay, so I'm telling, uh, for example, you know, I, you know, like a maybe image recognition, you can feed the, the computer with, I'm sure everybody has 
you know, experience that when, when, you know, when you go log on to something, you have to, you know, like they'll ask you, okay, so find the uh, bicycles for me in, the, in that. It's kind of like lots of lots of data. That's kind of AI, that's machine learning, that's a supervised learning. And uh, we, we need to uh, brainstorm what that can do for dispersion modeling. Um, and be, be aware that, you know, machine learning and AI, they, they, don't, they don't result, you, you cannot expect it's like 100% correct at the first trial. And unlike, the, unlike those programming, like a little tools that you tell a computer what to do, you know, as long as your code is right, every time it's gonna do the right thing. But like for machine learning, for initially without, with limited sets of data, you know, it learns from the data. It not necessarily come out with every, you know, all, all, every time it's right. Uh, as long as you can get like maybe 90% of the time right, you know, it, it's it's pretty good, you know, AI machine learning. So um, I want to say, you know, so it's, you know, we want to find, it's like a Veen, Veen plot. Like you want to say, you want to uh, look for what AI can do or cannot do. And you want to look at what is valuable to dispersion model or whatever your project is. Find, you know, find their kind of like a, their like common area that you know to to try to brainstorm some projects in there. I mean, I'm just started with that. You know, I'm thinking about the next steps of you know. One of my thought is, you know, when you go to a client meeting or whatever, they'll they'll give you some scenario. They they show you a map. And they'll immediately ask you, hey, do you think I can pass a model? And usually I'll just tell the clients, hey, you know, it's hard to say. You know, you have to give me all the, you know, information. I run the model. Until I run the model, see the output file, I cannot tell, I cannot guarantee whether it's failing or passing. Although I can tell you from my past experience, this looks like passing, this doesn't look like. Maybe this is a starting, maybe something we can try, maybe with uh, enough data. And feed into the computer and computer learns it, you know, tell them, you know, like a, you use some reinforced learning, tell them that this is a pass or not. I mean, it can hopefully to get to a certain, you know, accuracy so that, you know, um, so that a computer can tell, tell the right answer. And then you can bring your program and to a client meeting and say, hey, okay, so I, uh, you tell me something, I quickly put in the stacks, okay, so, but I, I, I don't run AI mod, but, you know, my, you know, my, my kind of program can tell you your chance of passing, things like that. I mean, uh, lots of things, you know, with AI machine learning, it opens a whole new world for us. And, you know, uh, we need to start to think about this before, you know, everybody's starting doing it. So, um, that is, um, that is uh, my presentation, and thank thank you everybody. And uh, would like to see any questions. Sure. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes, yes. Um, the program I, 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 you know, can write something like this. And this, is, you know, I have two pro programs I write. You know, the the first program only look at the GLC max location, and this is what TCQ usually, you know, ask for. And I, I, I always feel that's not making hundred percent sense. You know, because you can have a GLC max that like kind of worst case location you have maybe say 35 exceedance on a neighboring, you know, you know, kind of receptor, it's less than that GLC max, the highest, but it has 48 hours or like even 200 hours. But TCQ don't care. They only look at GLC max. So this program specifically look at um, the GLC max and write, you know, write that kind of like exceedance, you know, the, the, the table goes even longer, like for, for four times, 10, 10 times. But I have another program that can capture, you know, you can do so much with the Maxify. It's like a 
like a gold, gold mine probably like from the Maxi file. You can actually grab all the different, you know, um, locations that with exceedances. And that program runs a little slower than this one. This one, you know, like 40, 40 or 50, you know, Maxi file runs about 10 seconds. The other one probably takes a minute. <laughs> it, but it creates, um, creates a, you know, uh, it creates a file that can tell you each in the, each of the maxi file. Okay, so I have maybe mm, 50, you know, receptors that have exceedances. What is their exceedance situation? And then I use that. Uh, I use that because it in order ha has a list of uh, all the exceeding receptors. I give it to my ArcGIS team. They can create a map for me and showing where the you know, the receptor, you know, are, but, you know, I know that, you know, um, at that point, you know, you can probably already use an, you know, third party GUI to, to make that, you know, plot, but, you know, you, you still have to do one by one, but, you know, you can write a program to get it all done together. So, um, yeah. Uh, and then we can make, make an argument. Okay. So I, I had experience actually just, uh, you know, last year, you know, we did a project all the exceeding receptors are on on a highway road and we just showed the tceq that map they they're happy with it and you know that they are like uh, transient in nature so not expecting somebody to take a picnic in the middle of a highway you know i hope that answers your question thank you thank you That's a that's a good question. That's that talks about uh, what's the kind of like accuracy, you know, like uh, it can go for air mod. I mean, air mod actually, it's not like um, it's not like uh, Kalpa for you know Camex or those like a uh, grid model that you know it depends on you know what kind of like a uh, meteorological data you have. Uh, for for those of grid modeling that you know you use for Chemex that you know it's like uh, four by four kilometers or one point three by one point three kilometers that that's the resolution that's the best resolution you can get you can probably get it even better like to like about four hundred meters by four hundred air mod it's a it's a kind of like a, I wouldn't say linear but it's Gaussian Gaussian dispersion the Gaussian dispersion actually can calculate uh, a number like you know, a, a concentration in every, as long as you give it like a distance, it'll probably give you something, you know, like uh, in TCEQ, the requirements, like the very, the finest resolution they want is like 25 meters apart. And uh, then, you know, we'll go, go further, like 100 meters, you know, 500 meters, you know, a thousand meters, kind of like those receptors uh, spacing. But uh, I don't see why you can't, you know, get getting even, you know, more finer, like it was 10 meter apart. I mean, um, how accurate is are, are the numbers? It, that that's a question, you know, kind of like a, we'll talk about the Gaussians, you know, Gaussian distribution thing. But it's it's like a, it's not like a grid model, like a CAMEX. That's kind of like a, it's like, but one by one, one block by one block. It, it depends on what met data you have, but. Air mod like the Gaussian dispersion, it just takes the meteorological data over that hour. It just, you know, it can calculate, you know, all the concentration on its pass. So air mod, I, I you know, how accurate it is, I'm not sure, but you know, you can, you can find out concentrations as one, two, three, whatever. You know, it's it's a like a continuous function. Exactly. And uh, the met data, uh, I actually talked, you know, asked a question this morning. That guy was doing, uh, the previous presenter was doing like, you know, met data kind of like a thing. And, you know, you, you actually take wind direction and wind speed, maybe every five minutes, maybe every one minute. How do you determine your 
hourly, you know, your hourly average wind speed and wind direction. Do you take the scalar and take the average and and you know average also average the direction, or do you take the vector, the sum of the vector determines, you know, what you know direction it act eventually go effectively that hour. You know, you you go this direction one minute, that the other minute, and maybe then then the vector sum will be your your hourly, you know, hour, you know, and it's a it's a lot of debating. I think uh, lots of uh, uh, you know places still we are using the scalar arithmetic average, which may not give you the best kind of idea. But you know, like air mod, it's um, it's the the finest time interval is one hour. So that's kind of like um, a. But there are models like Hamex that like, you know they can you know get into like a minutes. And, like finer, but that's a lot more expensive, you know, like hundred times expensive modeling. And it's not required. <laughs> no, no, not not much, you know, uh, regulatory drivers yet. So, you know, there is a uh, much less, you know, efforts being put into there for like research or, you know, project. And nobody wants to do a CAMEX for PM 2.5 or ozone. You know, right now, you know, only, you know, EPA is doing it and EPA or state local agency doing those CAMEX, but, you know, air mod is still being the most efficient and kind of relatively, you know, reliable, you know, model. Sure, sure. Uh, I, I have a, okay. All right, thank you everybody. And now uh, we are up to our second second talk. Uh, Bar, do you wanna give a few minutes? Yeah. Awesome.